Gamar Tov, and uh, greetings from the Holy Land, and apologies for my post-Yom Kippur cult. I'd like to draw together a couple of disparate threads that I think will create a, a, a picture and a message that's appropriate both for this time of the year and for the holiday of Sukkot. I begin with the end of Moshe's life, with the last day as recorded within the Torah. At one point, a Kodesh Baruch Hu calls Moshe and Yehoshua to the Ohel Moed, to the door of the Ohel Moed, and turns to Moshe and again gives him a message, which in this case is fairly devastating. He turns to Moshe and he says, I want you to know that your people are going to stray. I will hide my face from them. And eventually, however, I want you to write down the Shira, I want you to write down the Torah, because eventually that Shira which you write down will serve to bring the people back. And one has to wonder why it is that a Kaddish Baruch Hu has to give such devastating news to Moshe on the last day of his life. We've already heard the Klalot and Brachot, we've gone through the Tokachot, Moshe knows full well of that which is bound to happen. Why must HaKadosh Baruch Hu reiterate that on the day that Moshe is about to leave this world? I think, strangely enough, an answer can come to us if we ask another question. This one concerning the holiday of Sukkot, the Yantaf of Sukkot. Generally, when it comes to mitzvot, we're very machmir on ourselves. We try to do a mitzvah in the most beautiful fashion possible, particularly when it comes to the Arba Minim, for example, the Yesro that we have, we, why should be as Mahudar as it can be. And yet, strangely enough, when it comes to the Sukkah, the fundamental law is that a Sukkah can be incomplete, that you don't need four walls. You can get by, the, the, the Halakha tells us, the Frey Halakha tells us, the Gemara tells us, you can get by with, with three walls, you can even get by with two walls and a portion. And one has to wonder why it is that when it comes to the mitzvah sukkah, we're not more demanding. Why don't we insist that if we have the opportunity and we can make that complete sukkah, that that, that should be the halakha, the sukkah should have its complete walls. Here, I think the answer can be determined if we see the yant of, of sukkot as the counterpoint in some ways to the yamim norayim and the sukkah as the prism through which we re-enter the world after leaving the rarefied atmosphere of the Yamin Norai. Sukkot serves as a counterpoint to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur in the following way. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we try to control uncertainty. We turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and we pray, please give us a good year, give us a healthy year, give us a year of success. We're frightened by the uncertainty that faces us. Faces us. We want to have a certain life, a life with, with success and with health, where all is right and all is good. We pray, we daven, we hear the cadence of Ne'ilah, we feel uplifted, we're closer to our Kodesh Baruch Hu than we are at any other point of the year, and we walk out of the Yamim Norayim feeling with a great deal of, of success that we will be confident Please, God, that our prayers have been heard and an HaKadosh Baruch Hu will grant us a good year. But then we enter the Sukkah, and we enter the holiday of Sukkot. And on this holiday, we embrace uncertainty. We leave the permanent and we enter the temporary. I say, Sukkot HaKema V'Diras Arai. We realize that we're entering these huts, these... these um, booths in which HaKadosh Baruch Hu, reminding us of the Anane HaKavod that protected us in the Midbar during our travels, and we realize that our life is open to the Schach, our life is open to the sky, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu controls our destiny, and that our destiny this year, in spite of all our prayers, in spite of everything that we have brought to the table on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, may well continue to be uncertain that we cannot predict everything that will happen to us, and that we cannot even determine what is best for us. HaKadosh Baruch Hu will determine that for us. As part of this message, I think that what our tradition is telling us is that we have no right to expect 
a perfect sukkah. We have no right to expect that those booths in which we'll dwell throughout this year, that those, that that structure that marks life and journey itself is going to be perfect, that it's going to have four walls. It may only have three. It may only have two and a half. And we embrace that uncertainty, and we go even further. We recognize that not only is uncertainty part of life, but it's an essential part of life. Incompleteness and failure is very much part of who we are. And failure is what propels us to success. If we don't try, we're not going to fail. And it were eventually, if we try, failure is part of our existence. And we can't protect ourselves from it, and we shouldn't protect or try to protect ourselves from it. That's the difference when we come to the holiday of Sukkot we recognize that it is the imperfection of life that will propel us to success, to achievement, to working harder, to make things as perfect as they can be. It's very interesting. I'm here now in Israel as an Ole Chadash, but I remember coming here on one of our trips as part of the Shul mission, and we one day we had a special day, which was meant to be a day for high-tech. And one message that they kept repeating over and over again to us was, you know one difference between us and the United States and other countries, why we're so successful? Because we embrace failure. If somebody fails in another country, they get fired. Here, they get promoted. Because if you failed, it means you tried, and now you've got to try harder, and you're going to try harder. And sooner or later, we come up with the right, with the right design. But it's even deeper than that. Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur themselves recognized that we would fail. And it was the process of coming back, the tshuva, the moving past the failure towards success that makes us grow. And that's what the sukkah is telling us, that if we fall, if we stumble, then it's good that it happened because it will allow us to grow from that stumble and from that fall. And one message I think that comes from this is, is to parents, and we might share it with our, the parents in our communities that too often we try to protect our children from failure. True, too often we're trying now to coddle them rather than recognizing that that failure will propel them to greatness if we simply allow them to stumble and pick themselves up. And perhaps, finally, this is the message that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is giving to Moshe on the last day of his life. He's saying to Moshe, Moshe, I can't promise you a perfect sukkah. I can't promise you that you're your people will succeed always and will rise to the challenge every single moment of their existence. But in fact, I'm telling you, Moshe, that were I to promise you that kind of existence, it would be sad. Because it will be because your people fail and then pick themselves up and succeed that they will be the great people that they are. And I'm promising you that that failure will propel them to greatness. Be'ezra Hashem. I'd like to believe that we've begun to see the time when that greatness is beginning to shine. If you heard the noise in the background that's building here in Eretz Yisrael, right outside of my apartment, it's amazing what's happening here. It's, it's truly, truly amazing. And to recognize the failures and the difficulties from, what, from which we have come across history to be at this point is to realize that Be'ezra Hashem, we may be seeing the cusp, the beginning of true success. Be as Rosh Hashem will rise to that challenge with a Gamar Khatimatova to you all.